I'm James Turk. I'm a director of the Gold Money Foundation, and it's my pleasure to be here today with Marcus Kerber, an attorney as well as a professor of finance and political economy at the Technische Institute uh, Universität in Berlin. Uh, Marcus, thank you for being with me here this it's morning. Pleasure. There are a number of things I want to talk to you about, but I'd first like to start with the uh, developments of the uh, Euro in Germany and the, the court case that you brought to the German Constitutional Court. Can you provide us with a little bit of background information as to what you've been doing there? Yes, when uh, the bailouts were, have been voted in, in May and June uh, 2010, uh, I initiated a group of uh, plaintiffs who were not willing to accept that uh, the European Treaty is going to be violated because we have in the European Treaty, uh, so to speak, a normative pillar, which is the no bailout clause, which means that uh, the European Monetary Union is a, um, the experiment of creating a monetary union, single currency between sovereign states, which presupposes that these sovereign states remain liable for their own debt. So the case of financial assistance to, Greek, to Greece was no longer covered by the treaty, the treaty gives only uh, authorizations for emergency measures in case of uh, uh, natural catastrophes, whereas the Greek case was a case of uh, uh, self-made um, poor fiscal governments. Soon after that, we got uh, the so-called uh, Euro crisis with Mr. Trichet interpreting the markets as being dysfunctional and uh, giving uh, guidelines to the governments to create what he called a um, a uh, rescue or stabilization mechanism, which was decided overnight, uh, 9th and 10th of May, without the heads of government being really uh, aware of what happened. As a matter of fact, these um, bailout measures um, have not um, stabilized the market. They have not soothed the market um, because the fundamental problems of the Eurozone have not been solved. And the fundamental problems of the Eurozone are, of course, uh, the fiscal imbalances, the budgetary imbalances of Ireland, uh, Portugal, and Greece. But uh, the, 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 the underlying problems are the lack of competitiveness of these countries. Mm -hmm. So this was a, an ill-conceived concept to create a monetary union with so divergent economies. And as a matter of fact, apart from the initial years where the sweet poison of the euro created some bubble economies in Greece, Portugal, and uh, Ireland due to local factors. But sooner or later, they recognize that they are not competitive enough to compete with the northern states. So we have, as a fundamental problem, a split in competitiveness between the northern states, creating, generating a trade surplus. That is the case not only for Germany, but for Austria, for Finland, for the Netherlands. Uh, and the southern states, including France, with large trade deficits and balance of payment problem. So um, the fiscal measures, the measures of fiscal emergency in form of bailout funds, have not cured um, the problems of catching up with competitiveness. As all these countries, these problematic countries, cannot devaluate uh, to buy time in order to reorganize their economies, uh, there has to be a very harsh program of recession which brings growth down. So as a matter of fact, not only the problem which Greece tries to achieve within two, three years is a problem which can be achieved within a generation. Uh, now trying to achieve it within two or three years brings the economy so much down that as a matter of fact, as a result, revenue, uh, tax revenue goes down. The Greek case is a special case because um, it's a combination of um, uh, bad fiscal behavior and deficit spending. The Irish case is a case of um, uh, a country of four million people being totally overbanked, where banks have uh, led to operations and have attracted risk which they should have avoided. And Portugal is perhaps the most classical case of the fundamental problems of the Eurozone. It is the country which still didn't have that much of a competitive real economy, but now is imprisoned in the monetary costume of uh, the euro. So they cannot devaluate, and they, the, the euro is simply too expensive for them. So I don't think it is possible to, uh, for Portugal to become very, very competitive in a, say, not too distant future. 
So the, the consequence is you have uh, not only enormous trade balance deficits and balance of payment deficits, you have fiscal and budgetary imbalances, uh, which have now been to be, have now uh, to be to be covered by uh, by by subsidies. So the first fund was exposing Germany to a risk of 122 uh, billion euros. This one, which is the beefed up fund with larger tools, allowing the fund to buy on the primary market, to be more a preventive fund. Germany is exposed to a risk of 211 uh, billion euros. And at the time of concluding this in the German parliament, uh, the uh, Brussels oligarchy, Mr. Barroso, the head of the commission, the head of the Eurogroup, Mr. Juncker, uh, and of course, uh, our French friends argue for an enlarged fund. So they know it won't be enough. It won't be enough to save or to rescue uh, neither uh, Spain nor Italy, and it will not cure the fundamental problems of the user. We took the government to court for the financial assistance to Greece and for um, the, the first rescue umbrella, which had a limited risk, too much, but limited, smaller compared to the one we have today. And the Constitutional Court said two things. <clears throat> they didn't consider the total fallout risk as a, uh, um, a risk for the existence, for the financial existence of Germany. They didn't say where the limit is, but they said, well, overall, uh, this would not make German public finance unsustainable, but there might be a limit of sustainability of accepting risk. So this borderline has still to be found in the court. And secondly, they said for any bailout, for any specific bailout operation, you need prior consent of the budget committee of the German parliament. So those who uh, triumphantly applauded yesterday's survival victory by Frau Merkel, will please take into account that for any further bailout in the future, the German budgetary committee in the parliament has to uh, deliberate on that, has to vote in favor. It. And without that deliberate positive vote, the representative of the board of governors of the European Financial Stability Facility cannot vote in favor. As the Germany, as all the other nations have veto, has veto power, so the situation is, uh, is blocked. We we'll see whether this parliamentary procedure is going to be fully respected according to the letter and to the spirit of what the court said. But as a matter of fact, uh, the jurisdiction only concerns the past. The new beefed up fund has not been judged by uh, the court. And uh, of course, I feel extremely uh, curious. I'm very curious to know what the court will say about a beefed up fund, which increased German risk exposure from 122 billion to 211. Because it's obvious that the tendency will be to beef it up again. Because the fund would not have the means to rescue Italy or to come to the help uh, of Spain. So um, apart from that, the discussion about uh, um, the bailout fund um, uh, is, uh, is absorbs uh, uh, the other problem of the Eurozone, which is the behavior of the European Central Bank. Whereas we have a discussion on the parliamentary procedure to vote in favor against a bailout fund, uh, which puts Germany on the way to fiscal union, Mr. Trichet's ECB, for more than three years by now, practices, as a matter of fact, qualitative and quantitative easing. Uh, in the financial crisis, they quite proudly said that they would give, first of all, to Greek banks all liquidity they need, all accepting all collaterals uh, they would uh, hand in, and in particular, agree government bonds. So they did uh, as well with Ireland and, and Portugal. So we have created, so, so, so to speak, a, a special banking zone including the banking sectors of uh, these three ailing countries. They can refinance themselves at conditions the other banks cannot refinance themselves. This is totally in contradiction with the idea and the letter of the single market, where we have the rule, the fundamental rule of non-discrimination. 
uh, how can it be justified that not only for a couple of months, but for years by now, um, ECB practices qualitative easing, creating different conditions of refinancing? Uh, this is not only a distortion of competition, which is fundamental as well, the common market, um, but it's a source of financial instability. So, Mr. Trichet, against the opposition of <coughs> um, uh, the German members of the EC board, the Luxembourg member of the EC board, and the Dutch member of the EC board, uh, has transformed um, uh, ECB to a fiscal, a, an instrument of fiscal policy. And he has assumed the task of uh, uh, being the guardian of financial stability. The um, continuous policy of qualitative easing has created uh, a discrimination within the European banking sector, within the banking sectors, the different banking sectors in, uh, in the Eurozone. From May on, we had the phenomenon of the central bank for the first time um, innovating, pioneering, as they said, purchasing bonds on the secondary market, which, according to us, is um, a breach of Article 123 and a breach of Article 125 of the treaty, because the, the, the European Central Bank has no mandate to intervene on the market in these massive amounts. By now, they have purchased for an amount of about 160 billion. This is far beyond their boundaries. This is no longer open market policy. Open market policy serves as a sort of fine-tuning of monetary policy. The ECB conducts fiscal policy. They are out of bounds and they have to be judged. And that's why we uh, have uh, taken a legal action in the Court of Justice in Luxembourg. Uh, and we will see whether the Court of Luxembourg um, will uh, be able and is willing to see that without jurisdiction in that case, ECB will be without any control. We began our plea in the writ by reminding a man for whom I have the profoundest respect. It is Lord Denning, master of the roads, who in the 70s in Britain, towards the trade unions, said, be you ever so high, the law is above you. Be Mr. Trichet ever so high, the law is above him, and uh, he deserves to be to get a ruling which limits uh, the um, self-authorization, the self-empowerment of ECB uh, as uh, some sort of fiscal policy fire brigade man. Understood. Is it likely that the court will um, take the case and, and rule on it, in your view? Well, or otherwise, is it too political, and therefore they're going to sidestep it? All constitutional. Complaints, complaints are very political. This is in the very nature of constitutional complaints. Um, uh, as long as a case is pending, and as long as I'm the attorney, I never make any comments on the court. Okay. Because uh, I suppose as long as I haven't seen the, the verdict, the court is being totally impartial. So now we got a, a ruling from the Constitution Court, and I give my criticism on that be it uh, within or as long as the procedure is lasting, uh, I commit myself to discretion. But of course, um, we do hope uh, that um, the violations of the treaty, which nobody puts into question, even not the central bank, uh, will be legally assessed. Why? Because otherwise, if they are not assessed, if they are not appreciated, um, uh, there would be uh, a precedent because the European Central Bank, being a pillar of the European Monetary Union, could act in a way totally independent of law, no longer subject to the rules of the treaty. We fought for these treaty rules, Articles 123 to Article 126. We said our consent to the European Monetary Union is subject to the implementation of these rules. No monetary financing by the central bank. Uh, no, uh, no bailout clause. No bailout of, of, of ailing countries. Now ECB acts to bail out countries, to help them. Uh, asking these countries to, uh, or urging them uh, to, uh, to organize austerity measures. It's not the task of the central bank to urge governments to 
organize austerity packages, it is the task of the parliament and the government to uh, come back to their senses and uh, to negotiate that with the population. This is a democracy. The governments have a contract with uh, the people. They don't have a contract with the European Central Bank. So we have a system in, in, in the European jurisdiction which presupposes so-called uh, uh, privileged plaintiffs, which is due to the fact that the great danger in the beginning years of the European community was violation of the treaty by a member state. In that case, the commission intervened and took the country, the member country, to the court. Or another member country found fault with the behavior of a, of a neighbor, and they took them to court. So this is what we call the privileged plaintiffs. But today, we see that the member states of the Eurozone, uh, the European Commission as the, the innate guardian of the integrity of the treaty, um, uh, are a cartel a conglomerate of institutional powers who, of course, have disputes between each other, but they are well united in the will never to take each other to court and to leave uh, uh, these, these, these normative pillars of the uh, European Monetary uh, Union uh, in, a, in, an, in, a, in a legally undefined territory. So we would like to bring light to that legal uh, territory because all these rules serve nothing if they cannot be invoked by a citizen. So our trial, uh, our action, our legal action um, is not only important for ECB, it is important to protect the European citizen against the violation of the treaty by European institutions. Understood. Were there any remedies in the treaty when rules would be broken that people would be removed from no. office or the, the, anything the, of that the, nature? The, yes, you can, of course, invoke um, breaches of the treaty if uh, the breaches of the treaty committed by uh, community uh, institutions have a direct impact on your situation. So nobody knows for, for the time being what is a direct impact. But we interpret that in a very large way because uh, the jurisdiction uh, which um, is at the, the, um, well, at the origin of that, that interpretation goes back to the 60s and 70s when the community had far less competences. With the Lisbon Treaty, there is a quantum leap of competences. And uh, this quantum leap of more European competences um, co must correspond to a stronger uh, legal control by the citizens. I give you another comparison. Germans have very much fought for political independence of European Central Bank because they believe very much in, in, in institutions like the cartel office or the uh, insurance supervision or banking supervision which are politically independent. That is to say, no government can give them instructions. No government could give the Bundesbank instructions to uh, uh, act in this or that way uh, on interest rates. Um, political independence in a supranational organization such as the European Central Bank is of a totally different nature. Because first of all, you have another public. So if Bundesbank had behaved like ECB, there would have been a public outcry, an outburst of anger, just to remind you of the fact that uh, in the 90s, the Minister of the Treasury, Mr. Weigel, a very simple-minded man, once said, well, we should better sell the gold reserves of the Bundesbank to uh, fill the gap, the budgetary gap. That was an outburst of anger. I remember and the, the Bundesbank was considered by the German population as a trust, as a fiduciary of their assets. Mm. So uh, if a Minister of Finance acts badly, Bundesbank punished him. Uh, so there was a countervailing power. That countervailing power, this system of checks and balances between a national uh, minister of finance and a national central bank is no longer there. And within the European Central Bank, um, Germany has as much voting power as Estland, as Cyprus, uh, as Malta, which is ridiculous. ridiculous. That's why, in any way, the European Central Bank is the great problem in the years ahead of us. It has to be reformed, uh, and it will be reformed, otherwise Germany will leave the European Monetary Union. Look at these 
press conferences with the number two of uh, ECB, Victor Constantio, considers himself as unfailable in his judgment. Uh, this is not the system of, um, of checks and balances uh, we have accepted in 1992. And the Germans are very attached to um, sound, sane uh, monetary policy, 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 which in the long run keeps the currency stable. Yeah, I mean, that's quite clear from the record of the Deutschmark, you know, from 1950 to 2000. If you compare the record of the Deutschmark to any other European currency, you know, the Deutschmark stood head and shoulders above all of the others in terms of preserving purchasing power. So the promise that had been made to the German people that the euro would be managed like the Deutschmark and that the ECB would be run like the Bundesbank, that was clearly broken. That is clearly broken, and it is becomes now extremely obvious after the resignation of my friend Dr. Stark, who resigned a little late, but not too late, to give a wake-up call to the Germans, uh, letting them know that what happens in ECB is exactly the contrary of what he has fought for. Stark was the man in charge of creating the monetary union. He sold the idea, which was an experiment, uh, to create a monetary union of sovereign states. You've never had that before, of sta states who wanted to remain sovereign. And um, he spent a lot of uh, um, work on, on, on the persuasion of those in Germany who were reluctant to do so. Ottmar Issing, the first chief economist um, of the European Central Bank, uh, is, uh, I suppose, at least appalled by what is now happening. Mm -hmm. So the new uh, president of the Bundesbank, Mr. Weidmann, uh, a young and promising man, is now trying to find allies within European Central Bank, within the board, in order to <clears throat> get more um, you know, support for the German stability of stability culture of a um, uh, monetary policy which uh, has a main object, price stability, full stop, and not the saving uh, or redemption of this or that country. Mm -hmm. the I guess similar to Mr. Stark's resignation was also Mr. Weber's resignation. That was a wake-up call too, wasn't it? Yes, it was a wake-up call as well, but Weber um, uh, has never really tried. He was uh, 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 a man apparently not willing to fight and to combat. Well, and he uh, did this in order to show that he's no longer supported by the German government, that he's not willing to take over ECB, a claim which... Uh, a German claim nobody could contest. So di he did a lot of harm to the Germans, as a matter of fact. Uh, a man in his 50s must be able to uh, face combat and uh, has to uh, stand up once there's an adverse uh, decision. This was the behavior of a typical German academic who didn't want to go on the battlefield. Mm. You know, I'm a naval soldier. Uh, I would have taken things in a different way. I would have. Uh, stood up again and to fight even more and more fiercely. Uh, that is a challenge. But Stark is a fighter. Uh, he has always been extremely uh, vigorous and combative. Uh, but uh, he could no longer uh, accept that after Portugal, Greece and Ireland, uh, under Trichet's presidency, which is a very autocratic presidency, um, the bank started even to uh, take outright positions of uh, Spanish and uh, Italian bonds. So he stepped down and everybody understood this is no longer the Bundesbank. Right, I think the message had been quite clear already that uh, um, particularly with the Greek decision that uh, obviously they were going in a different direction than the Bundesbank had ever thought about, even conceived of, uh, of going. Uh, the German government though, are they representing the will of the people? Or are they going off in a way to you know, try to preserve the monetary union against the will of the German people. How do you, how do you see that? Well, there is a, glow, a growing split between public opinion and uh, um, continuous bailout policy preached by uh, the German government as without alternative. Um, uh, there are always how, alternatives. Yeah, the, the, I, put it, I put that into inverted commas. Okay. So the, the German government is in a, what I could call, for, from an economist's point of view, in a prisoner dilemma. So Frau Merkel was at the very beginning of the Greek crisis tempted to say, well, let's kick the Greek out. 
Yeah, because otherwise there would be moral hazard. It broke cheap, the rules, cheap, so they, kick it they, out. Cheap, they, they, and, it, and the Greek case is a case, well, if you let that go, you cannot refuse any other bailout to any other country because it's a combination of cheating, deception, um, misgovernments. They used all the funds from the European Monetary Union for more than 30 years. Uh, this has not contributed to the competitiveness of, of Greece, but has some has made some rich people in, in Greece even richer. So today, those who have said, for what reason soever, at the beginning of the crisis, which was a small Greek crisis, uh, it was a small cancer which we have, our position is no Eurozone country can go bankrupt. That was a, a, such a blunder of declaratory policy that you have the uh, long-lasting effects today. Uh, Trichet said that. He said it is absurd for Greece to leave the user. No, it was absurd to tell in public that it would be absurd to, to let the Greeks go. You should have said, one never knows. That creates tensions in the market. That doesn't take away the uncertainty in the market. Uh, and that would, of course, uh, uh, give an incentive to the Greeks in order to demonstrate in the streets, do their homework very quickly. But the German policy, Frau Merkel, and particularly the Minister of Finance, Mr. Schäuble, who doesn't understand a lot about markets, said, we defend Greek whatsoever. And they thought honestly that the story would be over in one or two years. Uh, the first rescue plan was a plan envisaging uh, return to the markets in 2014, which was illusionary right from the beginning because the burden of debt of Greece, which is a country with the economic power of a little region in Germany, uh, is simply unsustainable. So they made very dramatic misjudgments. Now they are the victims of their own misjudgments. So, and they have to go on, and to tell you the truth, either the Germans will go into the road on the, on the, in the street and protest massively against bailout policy and against Trichet's ECB supporting our legal action, or these hurting panic politicians uh, cannot be hindered to go on uh, because you know uh, a herd of uh, sheep uh, once in action once in movement cannot be stopped uh, unless there's a precipice. Yeah. The German government, though, portrays the continued participation in the Eurozone as beneficial to, to Germany and the German people. You, you don't agree with that. Well, this is an argument which is put forward by, by all those who have not a foggy notion of uh, the capacity of, the, of an exporting nation like, like Germany. Germany had been an exporting nation before the Eurozone. Of course, in these periods, we had all that, the, the, the exchange rate mechanism. Well, you know that Lira and Fra, Fra, the French franc had been devaluated continuously. So there was a, a monetary problem. Uh, monetary unification was on the, on the agenda. But this did not hinder the German economy to grow. And this did certainly not hinder the German citizens to have a growing purchase power. And that didn't hinder the German economy to digest revaluations of the Deutsche Mark by making an increasing effort to rationalize and to be competitive. So the revaluations of the Deutsche Mark, we, ha we had of them quite a number, have helped the German economy. So if you take a close look at the growth rates within uh, the more than 10 years of Eurozone, you see that Germany is lagging far behind. Germany had, at the very beginning, very difficult years. Germany did its homework, increased competitiveness, and today uh, gets the benefits of that. This is not due to the automatic effect of the Eurozone. This is gossip. This is uh, um, unscientific gossip uh, repeated by some uh, journalists uh, and some politicians, mainly in France. We, the French, have always said, well, the, the euro has been, the euro cannot fail because it's a, it's a French product, it's a French architecture. And secondly, it cannot fail because Germany cannot let the euro go down. Germany has profited very much from the euro. So I don't, this is very easy to refute. So if we reorganize 
the Eurozone, which is under the aspects of optimization, a less suboptimal monetary or currency area, then we have to uh, bring together to converge those countries which are converging quite naturally. The Netherlands, uh, Finland, Austria, um, um, and Germany, of course. That is to say, the, the, the countries of the old Eurozone, of the old the Deutschmark zone. And then we can talk to Denmark, we can talk to, to Sweden, um, countries which have so far refrained from uh, entering the Eurozone because they are frightened to lose their, their monetary sovereignty. And they didn't know um, well, what, what is going to be the outcome of that. And they, they were quite right in, in taking a, uh, let's say, a little distant um, and reserved attitude. Uh, so I am in favor of orderly uh, reshaping of the Eurozone and orderly liquidation of what is currently the Eurozone. And if then France thinks that uh, the Euro as a French uh, invention should remain, well, let them hit uh, the Eurozone with all these Mediterranean countries uh, which are extremely greedy for further subsidies. That will not be easily possible. We can, within a reorganized Eurozone, afford to, to, well, to pay for one Mediterranean country, yeah? but not for more. Hmm. Uh, the Mediterranean club, with an extreme Greece, and with countries as, as condemned to incompetitiveness like Portugal, is, this is not a sustainable um, situation. I want to ask you a question about that, but before I do, I just want to go back to a point that you made that I'm very glad you made it because it, um, you know, there's this thinking these days that in order to be competitive uh, in the export industry, you have to continue devaluing your currency. And if anyone looks at the history of Germany from, uh, you know, uh, under the Deutschmark, you can see that um, the, instead of devaluing the currency, the, the currency was constantly revalued. The export industry um, uh, adjusted, you know, to those circumstances, but becoming more efficient, adapting new technology, et cetera. And that actually Germany prospered from a strong currency uh, that uh, the strong currency in a way even helped the exports in that sense by forcing the export industry to become more efficient. So it's a complete fallacy to think that you can improve your export industry by devaluing your currency. You can buy some time by devaluating for your currency. You can... Uh, it's a short-term gain you versus can, the yes, you long-term can, benefit. You can catch up or easily if you are a producer of consumer products, yeah. because consumer products are sold by the parameter of price. Yeah. But Germany has never been uh, very strong in exporting uh, simple consumer products or commodities. Uh, if the German machine tool industry is so successful, it's because of the quality of its products. Yeah, understood. And, and, and the exquisite reliability of the service. The, 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 our clients buy German products because they want the quality of these products, and the quality of these products is not totally independent from the price, but is less dependent on the price than consumer products. So the French propaganda saying um, the German growth of today is owed to the Europe is simply uh, nonsense. Hmm. There's a paralysis seems to be occurring. You know, government is moving down this one road. It's not solving any problems. How do you see this unraveling or unfolding, you know, in the months ahead? Well, um, apparently um, the parliamentary vote seems to be a victory for uh, Frau Merkel. It is more or less an act of survival. Let us now see how quickly the beefed up European financial stability facility will be beefed up again. Tools are going to be enlarged with leverage money putting, being put in. Uh, claims in Brussels for a further enlargement wouldn't surprise me. Some people say they should have a banking license. All this means that you um, continue the politics of debts. This is the economy of disaster. So I like nothing that phrase, is, the politics of debt, uh, because that's exactly what they're doing. They're just adding more debt to debt it. To it. And they, that, that would not solve the problems of competitiveness and the lack of homogeneity of the Eurozone. So uh, politicians in democracy always buy time to the detriment of the budget and to the detriment of the, of the taxpayer. 
uh, it remains to be seen if the, they bought enough time to survive, because sooner or later that edifice of debt will come tumbling down, and then we have a big bang, a crash, and that will be very difficult. That's, that's why I, I, I argue very much in favor, I advocate a, a policy of pragmatic um, realism, saying what is over is over. The euro was worth an experiment, uh, but now we have to draw conclusions from what is happening. The French say the euro is a political project. And as it is a political project, we have to defend it. That has no price. This is a typical French way of thinking. Uh, there is no project without price. And if the costs are generated by that project, um, generate a situation uh, where damage is beyond repair, you have to stop the experiment. Such as de Gaulle, a wise man, said, Algeria, French Algeria, is over. Let's stop it. You need, in that situation, taboo breakers. And this is a matter of uh, leadership. We have a leadership problem, not only in Germany, where somebody is standing up and say it's over, but in Europe. Because Take a look at the situation. The Germans spent an awful lot of money to make Greece survive. And the Greek say, well, this is an opportunity for Germany to make a lot of money. You can imagine the, 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 the number of discussions I have in TV with French, with Greek professors uh, uh, seriously putting forward theses of that kind. So there will be a certain clash anyway. If you can't avoid clash, if you can't avoid a discussion about who is the scapegoat, well, you have to, to, to advance things yeah, and come to a conflictual situation as soon as possible, because otherwise you wait another year and another year, and in the meantime you have such a burden of debt that even Germany will lose its, uh, um, its creditworthiness. And this is something we should uh, uh, be very careful about. Let me ask you one uh, last question, and it's basically, I want to get into the role of gold. You know, one of the things that's clear from monetary history is when you politicize the monetary process, the currency tends to be overissued and ultimately is destroyed. And in my knowledge, uh, I think the only um, uh, currency that wasn't directly tied to, to, to gold and did very well was the Bundesbank because it was completely outside of the political process. And of course, one of the benefits of the classical gold standard was that because the amount of gold was limited, it put control on how much it, uh, currency could be issued and mm -hmm. provided a form of discipline. Um, do you think there is a role for gold to play in a revised monetary union? Um, well, first of all, I think that the Bundesbank would do very well in claiming back um, the gold reserves which Germany owes, which Germany owns, because the um, Bundesbank doesn't have a an immediate influence or control on gold reserves. And one of the uh, aspects of the European Monetary Union, which is how I have very much deplored, is uh, the, exp the de facto ex expropriation of Germany as far as gold reserves are, are concerned. Okay, understood. Well, Marcus Kerber, this was a real pleasure. I very much enjoyed it. I'm sure the people, and there'll be thousands of people viewing this video around the world. I'm sure they will uh, find this very, very informative. Thank you for taking the time to meet with me today. Thank you. Pleasure.